you will hear a radio interview about an upcoming fair. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon and welcome to City Hour, the radio show that brings you all the latest information about events in and around our city. Today we have with us Cynthia Smith, who is heading up this year's City Fair. Cynthia, would you start by giving us some of the basic information about the fair? Where will it take place this year? I'm glad you asked that question because I know most people will be expecting the fair to be at the fairgrounds as usual, but we've had to change the location this year due to some construction work. You know, they're building the new high school in that neighbourhood and they've been using the fairgrounds as a place to store construction materials. So we've moved the fair to City Park, which I think is a wonderful location. Yes, that will be a great place for the fair. I understand that the fair begins on Friday morning with a special opening event. Actually, it won't begin until that evening, but you're right about the special event. Traditionally, we've begun with a parade, but this year our opening event will be a special dance performance. And the most exciting part is that the mayor will be one of the dancers. The mayor is a woman of many talents. Cynthia, could you tell our listeners about the price of admission? What will it cost to attend the fair? We're trying to keep the price down as much as possible. A three-day pass is just $25. Or you can buy a Saturday or Sunday only pass for $15. The opening event on Friday, the dance performance, doesn't cost anything to attend. And we're hoping a lot of people will come to watch that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Could you tell us about some of the events planned for Saturday and Sunday, the main days of the fair? We have a lot of exciting things planned. There are a number of events, especially for children, including a clown show on Saturday afternoon. On Saturday evening, we've got an event that can be enjoyed by the whole family, a concert by the lake. I'm sure that will be a popular event. Is there anything special planned for Sunday? Yes, a really fun event. And we hope a lot of people will participate. There'll be a singing contest in the afternoon. It's open to everyone at no charge. It doesn't matter whether you're an experienced singer or not. If you've always dreamed of singing on stage, this is your chance. That sounds like a lot of fun. I think it will be. I'd also like your listeners to know that besides the special events I've mentioned, there will be things taking place all weekend. For example, at the food court, international food will be served. You'll be able to sample dishes from all around the world. There will also be special games for children at different locations around the fair. Will there be things people can buy, souvenirs, anything like that? We have a large area set aside where there will be crafts for sale. This will be an opportunity to buy many lovely handmade things and to get to know some of our local artists and craftspeople as well. It sounds like there will be a lot of fun for everyone at this year's fair. Thank you for sharing the information with us, Cynthia. Thank you for inviting me. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 2 You will hear the head teacher of a school giving a talk to parents about some new classrooms. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for making it along. I know how busy you all are with term coming to an end. As you know, the aim of this meeting is to show you the plans we've got to add two new classrooms and how that will affect the playground. Now, I've heard that quite a few of you are worried that there'll be hardly any playground left, but I want to reassure you that that's not the case at all. I think there's been quite a lot of uninformed talk going on, and people have started worrying unduly. I certainly hope I can dispel any of your concerns this evening. Firstly, I have a plan of what the school should look like, which I'll project onto the screen. The school governors and the developers want to hear your feedback before making final decisions. Your feedback's very important. When I've gone through the plan with you, you can ask questions and we'll discuss those queries in detail. There'll be plenty of time to tell us what you think over the coming weeks. And once the plans are a little more developed, they'll be available online. There'll be a weekly update. And once the actual construction begins, you'll be able to check progress as it happens. Personally, I'm very happy with where we've got to. I knew we had to have the extra space, but I must admit I worried long and hard about what we might have to sacrifice for it. The developers have certainly convinced me that we've made the right decision. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. Right, can everyone see the plan now? Good. Let's start at the Balfour Road entrance, since that's where most of you come and go from. The Farley Road entrance and lower playground won't be affected at all. Now... As you come into the top playground, the two new classrooms will be on the right. There'll be a new gate and the steps down will be rebuilt. There'll be a ramp for disabled visitors too. On the plan here, only the parts of the building affected by the plans are shown. I'll explain why the hall is marked on later. So, as I said... The new classrooms will be to the right of the entrance and, as you can see, will take up very little of the playground space. We feel the Year 6 children need their own area away from the younger children. So, this one on the left of the two rooms will be the new Year 6 classroom. As you can see, there's no direct entrance from the playground. The plan is to include a small entrance area here from the playground for coats and boots and so on. Entrance to the classroom will be from that area. There will also be an additional entrance to the hall from this cloakroom so children will be able to get to the hall from two different directions, from inside the main building and 
from the new entrance area. I hope that's clear. Now, as you all know, the hall doubles up as the cafeteria at lunchtime. One of the rumours I heard was that we're planning to dispense with the cafeteria and open up a snack bar. I can categorically state that replacing healthy school meals with a snack bar is not remotely in our thoughts. The other new classroom, that's the one with the playground entrance here, is going to be an exciting new venture for us. That's because its principal use will be for the preschool and after-school clubs. More and more parents want that facility outside school hours, and we need a dedicated space to run these activities. I think there were also worries about the nursery school, though I'm not really sure why, to be honest with you. I can tell you now that the whole area on the other side of the main school building will be totally unaffected. The nursery will continue operating as it does now. There will be a couple of smaller constructions, modernisation work really, down here on the other side of the top playground. Cycling into school is getting more and more popular, so we're replacing the old bike sheds with a brand new bicycle bay. There'll be space for 60 bikes. The children's toilets will also be modernised and the children will be able to enter them from inside the school building rather than from the playground as they do now. There'll be brand new staff toilets in that part of the building too, I'm pleased to say. So, I hope that's at least started to allay a few fears. Take a few minutes to look at the plan that I'll get out of the way then I'll answer a few questions if you have any. Does that make sense to you? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a tutor and a student discussing transport. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, John. Come in. How's the paper going? Morning, Mr. Taylor. Pretty well, actually. Good, good. It's not all about bicycles, is it? I know you've got a thing about bicycles. Yes, but that's just... There are other ways to get around town, you know. Yes, I know. And I think I've researched pretty well all of them. Right then. So your paper's about urban transport in London, eh? Not just London, but that is going to be the focus. I've also looked at urban transport systems in cities around the world. Madrid, Beijing, Mexico City, Amsterdam, Paris, other countries too. You have been busy, haven't you? What's the purpose of your study? Well, two things, really. I want to see if there are more efficient ways of organizing urban transport systems while cutting down on traffic congestion, and of course pollution, and to find ways of encouraging people to use public transport instead of their cars. Let's start with that then, with cars. 
I think you'll have a hard time thinking of ways to persuade people to swap their cars for a crowded bus or underground train. They're convenient, comfortable, faster, and sometimes they're a status symbol too. Okay, I agree that cars will probably always be the most popular means of transport, but there are ways to cut down the number of people who bring their cars into the city. It's a problem that affects every big city, and several methods have been tried. I know, I know, as I've found to my cost. When I go into London, which I do two or three times a week, I have to pay five pounds to get into the city center. Has your research thrown up any more places where they do this? Oh yes, apart from London, there's Oslo, Stockholm, Singapore. Now there. In Singapore, they've got it really organized. They've imposed a tax on all roads leading into the city center, and they have electronic sensors that identify each car, and then debit a credit card belonging to the owner. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. And other cities, instead of charging motorists to come into the city center, have tried other measures, such as. Well, in Athens, cars are only allowed to go into the city center on alternate days, depending on their license plate number. In Bogota and some other Latin American cities, such as Quito and Sao Paulo. They've developed what is called a BRT system. A what? A BRT system, a bus rapid transit system. People leave their cars outside the city and take buses, which have special express lanes into and through the city. It's been so successful that they're trying it out in Mexico City, Beijing, Seoul, and Taipei. And other cities are pedestrianizing more and more areas of the city center. I see. How have these measures affected traffic congestion and pollution levels? In most cases, it has led to a reduction in the number of cars entering the city center. Certainly in Singapore, where it's now much easier to move around the city and the air is much cleaner than most other cities in that part of the world. London too, I believe. I can give some facts and figures if you like. Please do. In the first year after the tax was introduced, the number of people using buses to get to the city center rose by thirty-eight percent. Really, thirty-eight percent? Incredible. Yes, and the number of cars entering central London dropped by about eighteen percent. There's more. The number of people using bicycles and mopeds went up seventeen percent. I knew we'd get to bicycles at some point. Well, yes, in the city, the bicycle has a lot going for it. You can avoid traffic jams. There are no parking problems. They don't pollute. They're cheap to run, and they don't cost very much. Oh, and here's another fact for you. You can fit twenty bicycles in the space needed to park one car. Well, I never. But I can't see it catching on. Besides, we seem to be getting off the point. Not at all. China, Japan, and Holland have all integrated bicycles into their urban transport systems. In Holland and Japan, they've got special parking areas for commuters who get to the station by bike. And Japan has even built multi-story parking facilities for bikes close to railway stations. Then look at America. In New York, delivery services use bicycles because they can deliver messages and small parcels far more quickly and at much lower cost than cars or vans. Even the police use bicycles. 
In fact, in about 80% of the towns in America where the population is around half a million, the police regularly patrol on bicycles. And they have proved to be effective because they can reach the scene of an accident or crime faster and more quietly than officers in patrol cars, making a lot more arrests per officer. Well, you do know your bicycles, don't you? But I do need to hear more about the public transport system and what's to be done about that. And I'd like you to look a bit more into the economics of it, how much it will cost to improve the situation, and so on. Okay? Right. See you next Tuesday. Yes, next Tuesday. Bye, Mr. Taylor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear the first part of one lecture in a series of lectures about environmental issues. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture series, we have been looking at the most pressing environmental issues that the world faces. One of those issues, global warming, has become very fashionable to talk about in the past decade. Though I'm not trying to diminish its importance as a problem, it must be understood that the effects of an increasingly warm planet will not be seen for many more decades. One problem affecting the lives of people right now is the scarcity of water. The need for fresh water will only increase as the world's population grows, especially in developing countries. In the future, changing weather patterns that come with global warming will only make the problem worse. People need water to drink, cook food, shower and wash clothes. Most of the planet is covered with water, but unfortunately only a tiny percentage of it is fit for human use. Of all the water in the world, less than 3% is fresh water. More than two-thirds of that remaining percentage is locked up in glaciers in Greenland, Antarctica and elsewhere, also unavailable for human use. The water vital for life comes from lakes, rivers, underground aquifers, rain and snow. This surface water, groundwater and precipitation, is not disturbed equally across the Earth's surface. For example, Canada, which has about one-half of one percent of the world's people, contains about ten percent of the world's readily available fresh water. Brazil makes up about 3% of the world's population, but within its borders contain nearly 12% of the world's freshwater resources. As the economies of developing countries grow, the need for fresh water also grows. One example of this has to do with the production of meat. In some countries, the demand for beef increases when people earn more money. However, raising cattle is incredibly water-intensive requiring about 15 tonnes of water for one kilogram of grain-fed beef. The scarcity of water has a direct impact on human life. When people are forced to walk many kilometres to the nearest source of fresh water, it may take hours away from their day. This, in turn, takes time away from school or from other productive work that helps the general economy. A number of solutions have been proposed to deal with the scarcity of water. Some of them are technological, like the construction of desalination plants. These plants convert brackish salty seawater into water fit for human use. 
They are very expensive to operate and maintain, though, and cannot meet the world's growing demand for water. Other kinds of solutions involve only a little technology or involve modifying individual people's habits. In a rural part of India, a village facing water shortage started collecting rainwater. A simple system allowed them to save water that fell over a large area and use it during dry periods. In the suburbs that surround the cities of developed countries, house owners are using xeriscaping techniques. The main purpose of xeriscaping, unlike traditional landscaping, is not to use supplemental irrigation. This requires the use of plants, shrubs, and trees that are appropriate for the climate. In dry areas, this means planting ones that use less water. In the future, many countries will need to use a variety of these techniques in order to provide enough water for their citizens. Water security will be of utmost importance to those governments, especially in areas that are politically unstable.